This is Ron Babcock, and you're listening to the Matt Balaker Podcast. Hello, fine folks out there. Thank you for tuning in to the Matt Balaker podcast. Uh, please do me a favor and share this with at least two people you know. It does wonders for my self-esteem. Uh, today's guest is awesome. He's the youngest of five. He's also a fantastic comedian, editor, writer, and boy dad. So it makes sense that we're going to talk personal finance. Please welcome Ron Babcock to the show. How are you doing, Ron? Good, Matt. Thanks for having me. Thanks for doing this. And, and speaking of you know, thanks for doing this. Uh, I understand you got started into stand up comedy under pretty similar circumstances to myself. It was a dare. Um, mm -hmm. Take us back. What what was the dare? What happened, Ron? Oh, um, I was doing I was doing the study abroad program called uh, Semester at Sea. This was back in like fall of ninety nine, and it's a it's a ship you know, and it travels the ocean and you take classes on the ship and then you stop in different ports along the way. It was like, you know, as much fun mm -hmm. as it sounds. <laughs> and on one of the last nights they were having this talent show and we had started doing improv comedy on the ship. It was, we were taking classes from another student who had taken one Groundlings 101 class. And she was, <laughs> so we were doing everything like pretty much wrong, but we were having the time of our life. And they were doing this talent show at the end. And my buddy, Ryan McKee, uh, still my best friend, um, another great stand-up comic, we kind of looked at one another and we're looking at the sign-up sheet and he's like, you know, I'll do it if you do it. And there's another guy on the bill, our friend Chris, who's to this day one of the funniest people I know. And we're like, okay, let's just go on before Chris because we know he's going to be funnier than us. Mm -hmm. So luckily Chris ended up doing guitar because he's multi-talented. So he, was, he wasn't Chris. trying to be funny. Just, you know, he's just good. one of those guys who's good at everything. And so Ryan and I went up and that was our first time doing stand up. And I got to tell you, Matt, it was probably the, it was one of the best shows like I had for like the first 10 years of me doing stand up. Like it was, imagine performing in front of 700 people who just wanted to see you succeed because wow. they had just gone through this big trip together and they all, it was like a lot of positive vibes and like you could do it. And it was very specific jokes about that program. Like I was making jokes about like the drip in classroom eight, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> Lots of transferable material with the drip yeah. in classroom eight. <laughs> Be like, yeah, hey, what's up with this, huh? So, yeah, so Ron, didn't have any it, jokes, just like it, kind of recognition. It, it, it sounds like you've just been chasing the dragon ever since. Like the, you kind of peaked at the first show, and you're yeah. trying to reclaim it's that initial all, high. It's all downhill ever since. It's been one straight downhill i was like well this is great why does everyone do this like, oh. it's so easy well well you're a, a, a badass comic and and i'm not surprised that you actually took some time to prepare and, and i think that's the biggest gripe with a lot of people who watch new comics is like they think they can just wing it um and generally you can't what was your preparation like for your first gig i remember just sitting down Oh, wow. I went to this like little snack bar. I got a Coke and I just sat down with like a piece of paper and I was like, okay, what's funny. And I remember writing like keywords of things that I thought were funny and I was going through it in my head, but I was so nervous that I could only get through like the first like couple minutes before I would get flummoxed and I had to start over because I'm such like, and so I actually never rehearsed like the second half of my jokes. Mm -hmm. And that's actually one of the things that's why some new comics actually do really well. It's because like that, like you said, that they're just winging it. And it's because they sound really in the moment because they are, they're not too obsessed about getting the wording right. They're just kind of really being in that moment. And that's what you got to do as a stand up. And then we start to do stand up for real and we start to write jokes and we start to memorize them. And then we get mad at ourselves when we said, oh, I said, can't instead of cannot. <laughs> I should have. And that takes us out of the moment. And so you actually have to re learn how to kind of harness that that lightning in a bottle you felt your first time going up. Cause I know I went through that for years where I was, you know, you don't want to be that comic who just presses play and then you say your thing. So mm -hmm. it's kind of one of the reasons why crowd work always takes off crowd work clips always take off on social media is because it's, it's in the moment and it's, yeah. it feels even sometimes it's manufactured. It still feels like this organic thing and that's what, and it feels authentic and that's why people are drawn to it. Yeah. It, like the audience doesn't know how many times a performer is, done that bit before and i think the job of the stand-up is to make it seem fresh every time 
Yeah. And it's, it's a, it's a tough job. And sometimes you do it on some nights and other nights you don't, you know, I mean, I always describe sta- uh, pursuing comedy as just, um, I think the Scholar brothers said this, uh, and then I co-opted it for my, my own purposes, but it's, you're or part of it. I don't know. It's you're just, you're just swimming through a sea of failure and you just get, <laughs> and you get to an Island of success and that's it. Whether that's a, a late night booking a writing show, $50 for being in some guy's sketch, whatever you get to right. that Island of success. And then you jump back into a sea of failure and you just hope that the next swim is shorter than the last. Yeah. Each, each swim gets shorter and, and, and you develop your sea legs. And I'm going to try to beat this like sea analogy to death, but um, I'm, I'm curious. So you, you started at semester at sea and, and in, obviously you're in a really supportive environment. You have your peers there. Um, contrast that to when you felt like a quote unquote real comic, like, you know, when, when the audience wasn't people you knew, what what were the main differences that stick out to you? Um, I guess that's the feeling like there was, like, you know, when I, I guess it was even like, it was still so exciting because when I was a real comic and I was on stage, I was get, getting paid. Mm-hmm. And so just unlocking that thing of just being like, oh my God, I can't believe someone's giving me money to dick around on stage and like tell these like, and it still wasn't very good. But, you know, I was confident, and that honestly does most of the heavy lifting. Uh, it was – I was still just so enamored with it. Um, I wasn't as scared because I felt like – I like, once you start to get a couple jokes in your back pocket, it's kind of like having armor. Like, you're like, yeah. okay, I know this joke didn't do well, but I got this one in my back pocket that – if this doesn't go well, then that, I don't know what to tell you. But, like, you know, it's, it usually goes pretty <laughs> well, and that kind of makes you feel okay. So – I don't know. It wasn't like I was scared or anything like that. Like when the crowd turned against you, mm. <laughs> I don't know. You just, it's just one of those, like, it's not great, but you're just like, eh. like usually you're with your friends and usually they're having the same problem. And so you get up stage and you kind of have like misery loves company, you know, you have an instant support group. That, that, that's it, a really good point. Until somebody goes up and actually does turn the crowd, and, oh, then, you're the like, oh, and then you're like, oh, and you're like, of course, because you know he's doing it. He has yes, guitars. You're like making whatever excuse you can <laughs> to like justify why your friend did better than you. You're like, I did all new material that I've been working on for the last fourteen years. I just did an open mic a few weeks ago, or not a few months ago now, and I had taken a break for a while because I had a uh, my wife and I had a baby and. This guy, I don't know why he did this, but I just was like kind of going over my jokes in my head. And I was a little nervous because I hadn't done it in a while. And he like leaned over and tapped on my shoulder. He's like, hey, man, it's just an open mic, man. It's no big deal. And I I didn't know what to say, but I wanted to like, and I was like, oh, no, I, like I wanted to be like, oh, I've I'm, been on just for laughs, damn it. <laughs> I yeah, have I'm credits. Like, I'm, I'm good. Like I just, <laughs> I don't, but I was like, and I just was like, oh yeah, you know, let's, he's like, it doesn't matter. I'm like, no, I, I know what's, I know. And then. He went up and I had a very good set that night. He went up and he struggled. And afterwards he came to me, he was like, yeah, I was just doing a bunch of new stuff. So, you know, the people don't really understand. <laughs> I was like, dude, you don't got to justify yourself to me, man. It's, it's, a, it's an open mic. It is what it is. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, that's funny. Um, I want to learn about your Just for Laughs experience. Because when I uh, wrote the Greg Giraldo book, so shameless plug, please go out there and buy it, folks. Um uh, Greg Giraldo did it in the late nineties or mid mid nineties. And he used it to catapult uh, his career to land a sitcom. I know it changed a lot. And, and uh, you yeah, did it what, a... in, in, in 2012, right? Is yeah. It... I wouldn't say it's a catapult. I mean, at least at the time I did, it was more of a, I don't know, springboard, a, a tiny, like the springboard that gymnasts jump on to get into a horse <laughs> that they then fall off of. I think it was that for me. It, it, it was it was a guide to the balance beam we'll call it like so what yeah go. what what was your uh just for last story and, and how, how do you what were you expecting and what was the reality i i didn't know what to expect i i i did expect just a bigger a bigger wider stage in front of very mm. important people i had to audition three times for it um every audition was a good set like i felt like i really i did a good job i used to do this bit where i I'm not a juggling comic, but I have a bit where I juggle devil sticks and I, I, the bit is basically just me yelling that I hate that I know how to do this. So it's just <laughs> imagine a person juggling really well, because this mm-hmm. is what I did in high school instead of like going on dates and I <laughs> just, I'm just yelling it. So it's a fun bit, but so that's what got me into just for laughs. And it was kind of a, a double-edged sword because it's this thing that's very memorable. But then whenever I remember seeing this, like one agent guy at a party once he looked at me, he's like, 
devil stick guy. And then I never did that bit again. <laughs> I, like, I don't want to be that guy. The whole bit is that I don't want to be this. Um, so my, my experience with just for laughs though, was, uh, I was a bundle of nerves. Everybody was, I barely hung out with anybody before my sets because I remember going to the hotel and going swimming and like trying to work out the nerves and just constantly going through my set. Um, again and again and again and just and i remember just wanting to really well on the new faces and i think i closed it out and i was like hey, which is just the worst because you just hear everyone before you go up and just murders and i wasn't it wasn't like i wanted to be the best i just wanted to like hold my own mm -hmm. i wanted to this is like my east coast like immigrant uh mentality of just like you know I just want it to be like, I just want to be up there and like have not have anybody go. I just want to assimilate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just want to be part of the group. So <laughs> I had, I remember the review of my set was like, wow, we really, he was really funny. And I, I, I did one joke and then I got to the devil stick stuff and their stuff was like, we, the, the juggling stuff was fun, but we would rather have seen him do like more of just his jokes. Cause we really liked those. So oh, I was like, nice. I was like, okay. And uh, afterwards was a whirlwind of generals. And that's where you think like, Oh, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna be a guy. I'm gonna be the guy because you're yeah. you're meeting with like I don't know like ten to twenty meetings and the general is just like the very quick like who are you and I was with my manager and then you know it basically got to be a theatrical agent and I got out to go on a bunch of theatrical auditions that I didn't book so you know <laughs> Silicon Valley I was up for the role that uh, T J Miller played so oh. I I auditioned for that and failed <laughs> well that's a good thing to fail for um, but. You know, we all fail at pretty much anything that's fun or, or worth trying, but a lot of us yeah. kind of compound that by spending too much and being frivolous and mm -hmm. not having the immigrant mentality. Uh, you, you have kind of a passion or a skill set for personal financing or personal finance. Um, where did this come from? Uh, I don't know. Being like 20 grand in debt and realizing <laughs> I needed to like figure this out. Um I mean, my mom is very frugal. She would make me, she would sit me down and make me listen to sound money on NPR when I was like 12 years old. And so I had this like thing instilled in me from a very young age of just like, you don't carry debt. And so then when I was doing, like, I was like, I'm a professional stand-up comedian. Yeah, but you're like barely hanging on. Like I was yeah. making a living at it, but the living was just, I mean, it was brutal. And so you know, I would use my credit card for things like gas and groceries, not like going out for like a night out of drinks. I was using it for like necessities. Mm -hmm. And then the money I made from comedy would go towards paying my rent. And so over time, you know, I just like a couple of, I had to help out with family stuff for a while. So I wasn't making any income. And so all lo and behold, I looked down at my like credit card and I just did the math. I'm like, I can't believe I'm 19 grand in debt right now. And so I worked really hard. I listened to a podcast once and it, it was something about like your debt is like a hair on fire emergency. And it really lit a fire of like, I got to start taking care of this. And so I started paying it down. I basically attacked it like $50 at a time. Like anytime mm -hmm. I got 50 bucks paid, I would open up my phone. I'd make a $50 payment and then I'd run to the bank and put that $50 in it. So I could basically spend it on my debt before spending it on anything else. Towards the end of actually paying off the debt, I just started to really get into the whole world of personal finance of just... Mm -hmm. I was like, because the way I made money was, I don't know if you're like this, but like, I always just thought of it as like a, I was on a train and I was just putting down tracks. And if I had like a, a bank account full of like 10 grand to me, I had like all this track and I was mm. like, oh, this is great. And once I got to the end of that track, I'd be like, oh, I need more track. And I'd have to worry about that. So I started to think like, I know that this isn't a sustainable thing to do for my life. Like, how could I learn more to like, you know, how can I get more money basically? And right. then I started to learn about investing and making your money work for you. And that was like the thing that really unlocked it for me. That, that's an important lesson. I mean, I, I was an econ major on, and it's kind of sad how my, uh, my, dad was an, my dad was an, e, my dad was an econ teacher. And okay. like, yeah, so none of this stuff soaked in. When no, I was it's kid. so like theory land based. I mean, other than investing in broad based indexes, that was like the one thing I took away from undergraduate. And also I took an accounting class and the professor said, open up an IRA. And like those two things I, I credit a lot, but like, like, I mean, if, if you could kind of rewrite, uh, call it accounting or an economics class for, for high schoolers, what, what are some of the tenants you would put in your lesson plan? Um, I think I would, 
I, first of all, I would just have a lesson plan because I think it's like <laughs> the one thing we don't teach, which is blows my mind. Like we teach kids, we have all this talk about preparing kids for the real world. And, and if you look at most school curriculums don't have nothing like at all to do with financial literacy, no. like whatsoever. And so we send all these people out and then we want, and we, then there's all these articles like, well, 52% of Americans can't afford a $400 emergency, but at no point do we teach anyone about how to handle money. So they mostly learn from uh, like, you know, social media, just living their life and from mm -hmm. their family. So for me, I think I would probably teach number one, um, basically uh, just tracking your expenses. That's the, if you care about something in this world, you measure it. That's mm -hmm. how, that's why we have fuel gauges in our car. <laughs> So you need to know like how much is coming in every month and how much is going out. And all that does is just give you information to make decisions based on data. And most people don't track their, their money coming in or going out. It's just kind of like, do I have more? Like right. They have a rudimentary kind of crude. And that's that's fine, but you're never really going to get ahead. If your goal is to like get out of debt and make your money work for you, you, you need to know, okay, how much money do I make a month? How much money do I spend a month? Mm -hmm. and the other thing I would just teach uh, to high schoolers is just kind of for them learning the magic of compound interest. Because if if you can do that in your 20s, like you can be done by the time you're my age. Like right, you don't, right. where most people get started, like you know, I'm in my 40s and most people get started then. So like you could be done by then. Like you have to save so much less if you start mm -hmm. early because of compound interest than if you start later. Like I have to save so much more now than if I just saved a little bit more when I was coming up when I was 20. So you, you bring up a very important concept, uh, compound interest. Some people listening to the show might be able to write books about it. Some have never heard of it. In layman terms, Ron, what what's compound interest? And basically, it's it makes your money work harder than you ever can. <laughs> I mean, that's like so. Like you know, if you put if you get let's say you put money into a stock, a hundred dollars, and you make ten percent interest for that year, you know you. You give the hundred dollars. You purchase the stock. The stock has a ten percent return. So you made ten bucks at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Oh, now you still have a hundred and ten dollars invested. And now that the next year you make ten percent on one hundred and ten dollars. So you make eleven dollars. So then all of a sudden you have one hundred twenty-one, and then you make ten percent on that. And so you see where this is going is that you're not just making ten percent off that original hundred dollar investment. You're making it on the hundred dollar investment plus that interest right. and hence that interest level compounds. Now it doesn't really seem like a big deal and it starts off and it just kind of goes on this little, little kind of like slow, gradual rise, and then mm. it will explode. So if you start in your twenties, you're going to get to that explosion, that inflection point. So, and then it's just going to keep exploding until you're like, you know, retirement age. So it's, it's basically like you're teaching the concept of, of long-term it's, it's like the marshmallow experiment, you know, that psychology experiment they did with kids where if they don't eat a marshmallow now oh, yeah. and you get two marshmallows in 15 minutes or you can have the marshmallow now. We're teaching, we're trying to teach people not to eat the marshmallow now. We're trying to um, delay instant gratification, which is tough because everything about our society is geared toward feeling positive in this moment. Mm -hmm. You know, YOLO, live in the moment. And so, oh, so delayed it's not a, it's not a thing we teach. And so that's why I think financial literacy is important because it, it really does, it doesn't say you have to do it, but it's like, Hey, listen, if you want to be super wealthy, you got to like kind of exercise that muscle. I, I like that. Cause I mean, young kids, God, that makes me sound so middle-aged, but you know, we'll, they'll go to the gym and they'll kind of understand. Yeah. You're not going to immediately get ripped off, off one week, but you know, in a yeah. few months you can see results, especially when you're 19 or whatever. Um, but if if you put in a hundred bucks a month, you're not going to see hundred grand in a month. But in a couple of years, if you're doing it for the reasons you're you're talking about, Ron, interest is going to grow on itself. You're in such a better position than a lot of your friends if you do that. And chicks are going to think you're way hotter if you have more money in the bank. Something yeah, I I say like it's um it's basically you're doing your future self favors. Mm -hmm. So I'm always saying to like my nieces and nephews, I'm like, just do your future self a favor. Your future self is never going to be like, man, I wish I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Like it's always, <laughs> you know, like I'm so I've been unemployed since July. I was an editor on clone high for max and we wrapped in July. So I've been unemployed the last six months because of all the strikes that have gone on in, in mm -hmm. Hollywood. And so 
part of me has had to, for the first time ever, dip into my investments to like, you know, keep my family, you know, us going. And I am so glad that I've been investing because I've been like, okay, yeah, I don't want to do it, but sure. that's what it's there for. And if that wasn't there, like we would be screwed. So I feel so thankful for my past self right now that we could kind of go through this storm and like, you know, we're, we're going to be fine. We're going to be mm -hmm. okay. It just makes everything so much more balanced when life throws you a curveball. And that's the only constant is that life is going to throw curveballs. You just got to like, and the more you have invested that bigger, that catcher man it is so you can catch it. I mean, I'm so good. that was a good analogy, man. That is a good analogy. Yeah, the, 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 the mitt's going to get bigger than you're going to have like five mitts and any yeah. ball that comes your way. It's like you're catching face. a knuckleball, you know, the mitt's yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's, funny in a way to hear this ron because you know we we met through you know stand up and i view stand up more as an addiction than anything else or may, maybe i'll be generous it's a vocation mm -hmm. i don't think i would ever recommend it to someone who's just like looking for a career you know like oh, far from no. it's like you do it because you're a wreck if you don't do it i, I mean that that's yeah. kind of my like within entertainment circles what are i guess some of the more rudimentary steps that young call it creatives, whether they're actors, comedians, whatever, uh, you know, say, say you're, you're making under 20 grand a year, you know, you're kind of just scraping by. Oh yeah. Uh, I definitely had many years like that, you know, and you can't really, it's, it's a lot easier to alter your savings patterns than it is your income. So you mentioned mm -hmm. tracking for, for the people that are really like struggling, like what, what are some of the, um, some, some of the tips you have to like the, the young Hollywood types out there? Yeah. So like, I mean, I, I mean, I remember one year I made like $19,000. And both, I, I had an accountant because I just felt like you needed one. And I, and, and she was like, I don't understand how you're surviving. <laughs> like, and I was like, I don't know either. Like, I just, I think the, the stuff I talk about, like, it's even more important for people if you don't have a lot of money right now, because you're not, you never, there's a time period in your life, you know, typically when you're younger, you don't have a lot of money, you will have a windfall, you will get to a place where you have money coming in, you know. And the thing is, is you got to have those skills in place so that that doesn't just all pass through your fingers. And, you know, so you got to like have those ready to That's go. And so then, but yeah, you, otherwise, you're not going to be ready. It's just gonna, you're going to get to the end of it. I've had friends who've had crazy jobs, and they look around and they're like, what happened to all that money I had, you know, so mm -hmm. like, yeah, you could go out and have fun and like buy drinks and go out to eat, but like, you know, take a little bit of it and put it aside. So I'd say the, the, if you're just starting out, you have no idea about anything. Um, I think the best thing to do is to, um, one, get more knowledge, uh, and, and two is start tracking your expenses. So mm -hmm. I would say download a budgeting software. There's so many of them. Um, there's ones you can pay for, like YNAB. You need a budget. It's like yeah. 10 bucks a month. Some people are really into that. I personally am like, I don't want to spend money to count my money. So I use a, a, a an app called Empower. It used to be called Personal Capital. And it you just punch in all your, you know, okay, these are all my credit cards. This is my bank account. Uh, you know, this is my my investment Vanguard, you know, and then it just tracks all your, your stuff. And it's kind of mm -hmm. like a dumb robot. You got to point it in the right direction. You're like, no, no, no that wasn't that wasn't like computer expenses. That was a restaurant, you know, it was right. like, you got to recharacterize stuff, but what you could do, you do that for a couple months. And then after say two months, you know, you could just really take a look at it and go, okay, look at say my monthly, I spent say four grand this past month. Okay. Two grand was spent on rent. Oh God. I spent like $600 on restaurants. That seems mm -hmm. kind of high. And you could start to see and then make decisions. So I think tracking it is, really powerful and the reason why people don't do it is because it brings up it brings up uncomfortable feelings you then have mm -hmm. to deal with so i know when I, I i always thought i was like man i barely eat out i barely i bring my lunch to work i barely eat out and then i started tracking my money and i was like holy shit i eat out so much yeah. <laughs> I would go do open mics and every time I was out of open mic I'm buying a beer or I'm mm -hmm. getting like oh, I'll get a little something to eat it's only like eight bucks and it didn't seem like a big deal until I realized I'm spending like 15% of my monthly budget on just like random beers and food that I'm not even really enjoying. And mm -hmm. so it was more of a habit. So I think measuring things is probably the number one thing I would tell people just starting out to do. And even Because then when you start to get a lot, you have that skill ready to go. Right. Just knowing how much is coming in and how much is going out. 
the, the old adage, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, I think is, is, is very true. Uh, it's exactly that. Gosh, I mean, you're saying all these things that I should have put into practice, like I did in my 20s off and on, but just a few months ago, I have, I have a LLC. And I just finally, I was like, I'm going to do my own accounting. And I got QuickBooks, which I actually spent a little bit of money for. And I found like two or three, like, recurring payments that my wife and I have on a separate card, you know, that I like Amazon, yeah. I was like, I'm just paying 17 bucks. Like I thought, you know, just like stupid stuff, but I never would have known it if I didn't do it myself. And, and like people out there, it's, it takes like a few hours initially, you have to set up the stuff, but whether it's, you need a yeah. budget, QuickBooks, it, it ends up working for yourself and it'll probably pay for itself too. Um, it, it does. It, it is one of those things like, you know, you have a, we have a gym membership for our body, you know, and like, right. people are like, yeah, of course I'm going to like go to 24 hour fitness. It's like 12 bucks a month, you know, it's like, but we don't, we tend to kind of not do that for our personal finances. So I don't ever like fault anybody for like paying for YNAP, like whatever you need to do to get this side of your life sorted because it can pay so many dividends. Me, I just use Empower. It totally works for me. Um, I find it to be really illuminating, uh, especially now that like, my wife and I, like, I just, we joined all of our accounts under that. So she still has her accounts, but then we can both see like mm -hmm. what we're spending money on. And, uh, it's been good. So you can see what your wife's spending money on. Yeah. I can tell like where she is. I'm like, ah, oh, she's at target again. Oh uh, yeah. Well, this woman loves target. We have an agreement. My wife can make the money, but then she kind of tracks what she spends. And I'm like, all right, that's, you know, that that's the, that's the cost I have to, I have to bear. Um, <laughs> but you know, travel's a big one. Like um, my family, we just went to Colorado and my wife was able to book our tickets, our plane tickets just on points. And it, it took probably yeah. over a year or so of crewing enough. But what, um, I mean, this applies to people of all ages. What what travel tips do you have for us, Ron? Uh, I definitely was into the whole credit card churning for a while. And that's basically for those, anyone's unfamiliar, you you sign up for a credit card. They say like, you got to spend 3000 in the first three months and we'll give you 80,000 points. So you do that. And then as soon as you get those 80,000 points, you move on to the next card. And so I would do that. And you can chase has a, a rule called the five and 24 rule or five twenty four rule where if they start declining you, if you open more than five cards in 24 months, so you got to kind of like wait. And then, you know, basically I would do this uh, for some people. They're like, oh, that's so much like work. It's so much planning. But I'd be like, I just got two like, like flights totaling $900 for free. And I spent in a couple of like, maybe a couple of hours. So it's like, <laughs> okay, collectively I spent three hours on this. So it's like, I was getting paid effectively $300 an hour. Like that, right. that's worth my time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a bit more type A about stuff. So this is my video games, Matt. Like some people like have <laughs> Fortnite. I have like chase travel reward points. Like that's how I kind of like, that's where my head is. So I'd say it's people, and there's definitely courses out there for people online. There's like really dive deep. I would do like just the base version. Like if you and your partner have had like the same card forever, like just get a new, get the Capital One Venture card. That's a great one. Get the mm -hmm. Chase Sapphire Preferred. That's mm -hmm. even better. And just get it and get the points and just see how it feels. Do it for a year and then do do like a new, my wife and I are basically at a point now where we do like a new card every year, you know, mm -hmm. and then that'll be, that'll like, and that'll pay for one flight for the both of us somewhere. And so I think it's a, it's a really cool. It's really cool if you have a goal, especially if it's like, Hey, we've always wanted to go to Hawaii. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we're not going to go in the next couple months. We're going to go in a year. I'm like, well then go get the Hawaiian airlines card hit that minimum of spend and then, you know, book those tickets to Hawaii. Like there's mm -hmm. a way if you, there's a way you can use this stuff on your side. So yeah, I'm a huge fan of, of uh, credit card rewards. And, and I like how you presented like lo looking forward to something because a lot of personal yeah. finance, and, and this is me talking, feels like a chore. You know, like I, mm -hmm. I don't love accounting. I don't know many people that do, or even just tracking expenses. But if there's a reason for it, like going to Hawaii, then that's a whole different ball game. Uh, I, I love it. Like I'm one of the people who does love it, but only because I mean, I'm, I'm definitely controlling. And mm -hmm. so the fact that I could like control this at part of my life that I never felt in control, I found very empowering. And I was just that's, like, hell yeah. Oh, but that, with credit card rewards, I'm sorry. The one thing I wanted to say is that's only if you have 
That's only if you pay off your credit cards in full every month. <laughs> okay. If you don't like people, I've had friends. I'm like, dude, if you, if you're not at the stage where you feel comfortable paying off your credit cards in full every month, credit card training is not for you yet right. because it's like you're, the money you're saving is just going to pay for interest. So it's only for people who pay off their credit cards in full and they do that every month and they never carry a balance. No, th th thank you for saying that. And, and while we're talking about credit cards, um, in a prior life, I worked for an investment advisory firm and oh. pe people would always ask like new clients, what, what can I invest in that's going to outperform the market? You know, everyone, it, it, it's human nature. We, we want to like do better than the neighbors or, you know, do better yeah, than our people own want expectation. To be better than the average. Yeah. And, and the one th piece of advice that I could credibly say is, is really important. Uh, my other stuff, who knows, but it's like pay off your credit cards first or, or, I mean, if you have very low interest student debt, that's different than credit cards people, but like, it's almost impossible to find a Vanguard fund or a stock or even like a private company that will earn 15% a year. Yeah. I More think power to you if you point. can, but if you pay off your credit card bills, you're guaranteeing yourself a 15% return. The only, I would say like, yeah. I mean, cause you, it's like, you know, if you invest something and you get an interest rate, the market traditionally an average returns 8%. So if your credit card bill is like 15, 21%, like that's, you're not making enough investing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, your credit card is charging you more. So definitely focus on those high credit cards first, you know, and just, you know, if you did invest, you know, you want to put like you would be in your W your 401k through your job because that'll bring down it's getting into the weeds, but that brings down your tax liability. Mm -hmm. And that like I would say do that for sure. But then with your money that you get, like put that towards your credit card. Smart planning. Um how have your financial goals changed now that you know you're a little bit older, you're a father now, you have a family, like what they, what 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 do you want to see in like call it 10, 15 years for, for you and your family? They haven't really changed much at all, to be honest, other than I just want to have that sense of, I think the feeling of security is what I value most. So mm -hmm. about when I was 38, um, I really got into the whole fire movement online, the financial independence retire early. So there's this guy named Mr. Money Mustache and he has this blog and I read that his first this girl at work was like, oh, I'm really into Mr. Money Mustache. I went, totally. And I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> and so I went, I Googled it. And his number one blog post that I've, I've sent to so many friends, it's called the 4% rule. And that's what started it for me. I just read it. And basically it says that if you make, let's say you have a million dollars invested it, and you withdraw 4% uh, of that is $40,000. Mm -hmm. And if you just live on that $40,000, that million dollars the next year is going to make another forty thousand dollars you know mm -hmm. so it's basically you you have this perpetual money making machine so if you have a portfolio and you withdraw no more than four percent every year to live off of then that money will essentially always be there and this was based on the trinity study that they did back in the 80s and that's like the really simple explanation of it but that really unlocked something in my head i was like wait a second so i could like if i could save like you know let's say 1.5 million dollars invested that would kick off 60,000 in dividends every year. And then I go to my little budgeting tool. I'm like, how much did I spend last year? And I'm like, Oh wow. I only spent like 55 grand last year. Okay. So then all of a sudden I started thinking, well, how can I get, how can I get a million, million bucks and <laughs> invested? And so that's what basically I've been working towards and I'm not there yet. And I would argue with some friends. They're like, yeah, but what if you don't get there? I'm like, then I just have like a shit ton of money. Like there's no, <laughs> right. like, so if I don't get to retire early, I'm still have a ton of money for my retirement. Like, yeah, right. wow. I really messed up. So, I mean, my original, what a loser. Goal, yeah. my original goal was to be retired by the time I was 50. And I uh -huh. doubt that's going to happen unless <laughs> I have some unseen windfall, but you know what? I could get to a point where I could go down to part-time work. Mm -hmm. by 50. And I love what I do for a living. I edit animated television and it's great. But my only complaint is like, I love what I do for a living. I just wish I didn't have to do it all the time. Right. So I'm either always working like so much so that I barely see my family and I work from home or mm -hmm. I've been unemployed since July. And I'm just like, Oh my God, I just, right now, like <laughs> I have too much life in the work life balance. So <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, so I would love to like, I would love a part-time thing. And so I really got into the fire movement and I basically 
I don't know, for two years, I think I read every book on personal finance, listened to every blog or podcast blog. And I basically like, I, I, bought, I now send three things to people when they ask me about personal finance. And I say, if you do these three things, you will cover more than 80% of the population. Number one is that blog post by Mr. Money Mustache called the 4% rule. Take, you know, it's a good cup of coffee blog post. Mm. You read it slowly. Number two is an episode by Freakonomics Radio called The Stupidest Thing You Can Do With Your Money. And it's basically about broad-based index funds. And number three is the book, The Simple Path to Wealth by J.L. Collins. And that it's not, and none of them are get rich quick, but they mm. are get rich quick-ish. And it's basically, the big takeaways are uh, live beneath your means, avoid debt, and invest in a low-cost broad-based index fund. And that's the, it. The, the holy trinity of personal finance. Um, it's really, it's, it can be, a lot of people think that like, oh, I need to do someone to do this for me. Like, right. this is like, I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to mess it up. And I got to tell you, it is the easiest thing in the world for you to handle on your own. But people, it could also be the most complicated thing. Yeah. But honestly, I do everything myself. I was a complete idiot when I started. It is so easy. You just open an account at Vanguard, open an IRA, put everything into VTSAX or VTI. Those are mm -hmm. low cost, broad based index funds that track the entirety of the US stock market. And then you you get the average every year, no better, no less. And it, getting the it average works. is good. <laughs> it's like, what Warren Buffett told his wife should do after he dies. He said, just put it all in an index fund. The most successful investor of all time <laughs> said, just put it in an index fund. So if he's saying it to her and I'm like, I'm going to do that. And it it's worked out just fine. I don't try, I don't buy individual stocks. No. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about my finances. It's just something that happens in the background. I think he said that to all his wives. So, you know, it's solid yes. advice. I do. I, I used to get paid on a Thursday and every Monday I just would have an automatic transaction where a little bit of money from my paycheck would go into my investments. Mm -hmm. And, and I didn't, and I did it on a Monday because traditionally that's the mark, the day the market is down, mm -hmm. but I don't worry about trying to time it. Like, Oh, it went down 500 points. I got to go. It's just completely automatic. Cause they say the less you do, like the more successful you will be. So I said, I'm going to read this book, The Simple Path to Wealth. And I'm like, I'm going to do everything it says. It's just going to be the one thing in my life that I do where I just say, just tell me what to do. And I do it. And for me, it's worked very well. Nice. And that, that reminds me of another investment adage that uh, time in the market is more important than timing the market. And yeah. what, what the intuition is, is just have your money in something and, you know, preferably broad based, but don't try to like get cute. I, that was a mistake I made when I was younger. It's like, oh, things are oh, yeah. things are expensive. I'm gonna pull my money out, and and like, a lot of the gains happen in a very short period of time, and God knows when that's gonna happen. So just yeah, keep your money in if you can. The way you lose, I always say this to my friends who have invested. I was like, listen, if whatever money you put in, you can't, you got to say goodbye to mm -hmm. for like 15 years because you get your money's gonna work for you, but like you can't touch it again. I'm like, so if you if you take it out, you're losing. And that's how people lose is they, they lose their nerve. So you also have to invest in a, excuse me. Um, you have to invest in a way where you're not going to be, um, it's not going to cause you to lose sleep at night. Mm -hmm. So I never lose sleep. So I am like a hundred percent stocks. I don't invest in any bonds because wow. I'm extremely comfortable with volatility. I mean, okay. I've been doing stand up for so long. I used to have $8 <laughs> in my checking account. I don't care. Like, um, so I'm like, what's the thing that's going to make me the most money in 20 years? Cause that's how I plan to leave my yeah. stocks in there for and they said 100% stocks. And I went, okay, cool. Let's do that. Uh, that's so what I'm doing. 100% right? stocks in VTSAX. So my thing is I don't have access to a 401k, so I don't get to do that. So the first thing I do every year is I max out my Roth IRA. So you can put a total of 6,500 into an IRA, put it into my Roth. You could also put it into a traditional, but most people always just put it into a Roth IRA. Mm -hmm. And then after that, if I have any money left over to invest, I put it into an individual brokerage account. And that's... That's kind of like you just go, you know, your, your 401k always comes first, then you're an IRA, and then an individual brokerage account. Good sequence. Uh, you know, we're both parents. You, you have a young son. Um, I, I think about this, but I, I want to get your take, Ron. Uh, it's going to cost, I'm trying to be conservative, $200,000, probably more, especially when mm -hmm. your son's college age. Uh, assuming you stay in California, um, what do you think? And, and I'm kind of putting you on the spot. Like, would you rather your son 
not go to college and come out with call it $250,000 that can have a really good start to that 4% million dollar life you're talking about or spend the money. You know, I mean, there's, there's other benefits to going to college, especially if you're at UC Santa Barbara, which is not far from you. Um, and, and you learn stuff, but you're, you're also not working. I mean, how would you handicap that exercise? Like, what, what do you think would be the the right course well, of action for your family? I mean, to me, the course of action would be both. Like, give him the money if he wants to go to college. And if not, then he would be able to, like, kind of have that started there mm -hmm. for his investment journey. And so, thankfully, the U.S. government has an excellent tool for that called the 529A plan. So a uh, 529A plan is each state has one. You don't have to use the one in your state, but basically it's just an investment vehicle. You put money into it. Once it's in, you you invest it in one of the funds. So guess what? I invest in the Vanguard fund. You know, it's the surprise, total surprise, stock market yeah. index fund. Yeah. And it's 100% stocks because why, why do we need bonds? They're just there to level off the ride. I want to have as much explosive growth as possible from the age of my son being zero to the day he turns 18 and is getting, you know, ready for college. So, um, you know, typically the stock market doubles, anything you have invested in the stock market doubles every nine years. So let's say, you know, I was able to put in 10 grand, uh, which I wasn't, but let's say let's put in 10, 10 grand, the, you know, the day uh, my son was born, the age of nine, it'd be 20. And then by the age of 18, it'd be 40. Again, mm. that compound interest takes to effect. So it's like, a pretty good return on 10 grand to have mm. 40 ready for college. So, I mean, God, God, if I had a lot of money, I would just put in a hundred grand and then I'd have 400 grand and then he could go anywhere he wants. So you can do that. You can, a lot of my friends and family, you know, I'm like, Hey, don't like, if you want to get him a gift for the holidays or his birthday, like I give them the link and they can Smart. donate $50 to the 529. Hey, um, we have our uh, one through Ohio. They have a great program. Um, uh, New Jersey has ones. Some of the states, if you reside in them, you could also use them as a tax deduction. Mm -hmm. So California's was okay, but Ohio's was better. Um, it's very simple, the user interface. It's I just send the link to people and they can pop in a, a 50 bucks. And I'm like, thank you so much. So that's what we're doing. Now, let's say my son gets to 18 and he's like, I don't want to go to college. Okay, well, Biden, um, the Biden administration just passed the Secure 2.0 Act which basically made the 529A even more attractive. So now if you don't use it for a higher education expenses, you can roll over that 529A into an IRA. Mm. So now your, your kid now just has an IRA that they can have for their life. Oh yeah. And, and they're pretty liberal with what education is, you know, I mean, it can be yeah. vocational. It can be, a, but I mean, th this is even better, you know, it, it takes some of the guesswork out, but just to play devil's advocate, even if it was the worst case scenario and you're in some state or this didn't happen, wouldn't you rather get a 10% hit or would yeah. you know, and then get that money than piss it away all these yeah. years? So like that that's and the worst case scenario. It's kind of like a forced saving. So mm -hmm. most people's forced saving right now is their house, you know, because like yeah. they're paying off their mortgage, the, their home equity gets increased. And so that's their like forced saving plans. And that's kind of their, there's like, oh, when we, you know, we, this house is worth like 800 grand, you know, so we can move and use the house. And so I like a 520A plan because it's a little bit of a forced saving plan. It gives your your relatives something who don't want to just give a, a plastic toy. Like, yeah. in, you know, it gives them a place for those weird little 20 and $50 checks. And again, it exercises that muscle. So if you're making money and it's like, okay, you get paid on a Thursday, every Monday you have a little bit of money you know, go into your investments. And then once a month, you have a hundred dollars goes into your college fund for your kid, you know, and it's just, and it's so that those muscles are in place so that when you do have those, one of those unexpected windfalls in life, and we're all going to have those because, and they're going to be sad windfalls because the transfer of wealth from the boomers who are retiring and, you know, kind of living on the last days of their lives to like the millennials, the Gen X and the, and the Gen Z, it, it's the largest transfer of wealth in human history. Mm -hmm. So there's going to, and there's going to be a lot of people in the middle of it. It's going to be the government taking their share. There's going to be nursing right. homes and there's going to be some coming to like the grandparents or grandsons and daughters. And so when you get a windfall like that, you've got to have those muscles in place of like knowing what's the responsible thing to do with this money. Be like, okay, we got a huge windfall. Let's take a chunk of money. Let's put it in the college fund. Okay, let's take a chunk of money. Let's put it into investments. You know, you want to 
make all this money that our family members have worked so hard for. And the way I think of it is like, you know, I want to honor the hard work that my mom did by making the money she worked so hard for, or, you know, work as hard for me. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of the way I think of it, but it's, to me, it's like all these muscles that we got to start exercising and just these systems where you just have them in place and they're not a big deal. So mm-hmm. you're ready for, for when things happen to you. Smart, smart. So um, I think the, the listeners want to know, Ron, when it comes to personal finance, what have you done that you're most proud of? Um, you know, I'm most proud of, like, now that I've been unemployed for seven months, I'm most proud of, like, opening my account and and having, like, assets, like, 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 like I still have, like, uh, assets and a net worth, where in previous times when I've been unemployed, I just looked at this ever dwindling number in my checking account and realizing that when that gets to zero, I'm screwed. Mm -hmm. And so I like that. I'm not as nervous because I know like I have a a safety cushion and it's, you know, I'm really proud of the fact that I don't, I mean, I could call up my family and be like, Hey, I'm screwed. I need your help. And they would help because they love me. And I'm very grateful to have that and very privileged to have that. But I'm also really proud that like, I've kind of, you know, I'm, I've sorted my stuff out and I've, I've, you know, I'm okay. So if something happens, like I can handle it. You can handle it. Um, what are you most optimistic about? That I'm going to get a good job soon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm really optimistic about that because I know pessimism <laughs> doesn't work. So um, uh, I, I don't know. I think I'm, it's weird. I, I've been having a lot of like, uh, I think, we, you know, I used to do stand up like a juggernaut, like back when we first met. Mm-hmm. And then on it for a couple of years, like I just didn't do it. Like during the pandemic, I didn't do anything. I mean, I was, excuse me, I was working the entire time. Uh, animation was the one part of the industry that could move forward. So for like three years, I just looked at a computer screen and worked. It was the exact opposite experience of a lot of people. And it was great in a way, cause I was earning a paycheck, but mm-hmm. man, oh man, was it tough. And I just had nothing left at the tank for anything creative. And so now I'm looking forward to, I'm starting to do like more things that are just kind of more creative and more fun. Um, I'm trying to learn how to surf. I'm terrible. Um, but it's really fun. And I, I mm-hmm. forgot how much, I forgot how much fun it is to try something and just be okay with the pure act of doing it. Mm-hmm. Where stand up is this creative pursuit, but you're doing it to get money or fame or, you know, so I forgot how much fun it is just to do something just for the sake of doing it and be really, um, just really okay with just getting a little bit better at it and how, how good that feels. So I still haven't stood up, but I feel pretty comfortable on the board. I can sit up right now without falling over. So that's exciting. Um, and I'm just going to keep going in the water. And one of these days I'll stand up and then the next day I'll stand up a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. And I think those tiny little improvements are kind of, they feel pretty good. That's enough for me right now. You'll find your way if I like it. Well, where can people out there learn more about you, what you're up to? Maybe they want to donate to your kids 529 plan. Where, where, where oh, can sure. They, yeah. Where can they <laughs> meet up with great. you? To plug my kids 529A plan. I think that would start <laughs> doing that instead of merch at the end of shows. Like, here's this link. You want to hear 20 bucks? Um, we'll send a selfie with me and him. Uh, I'm at Hey Ron uh, on Instagram. You can pretty much find everything there. I deleted my Twitter. Because I was like, this isn't healthy anymore. And I'm in the midst of redesigning my website, heyron.com. But honestly, at Heyron and Instagram has has all my stuff. You can see um, pictures of, of me and my son if you scroll back far enough. Do you post well, pictures of your kids online? Like, I, I don't know whether we should do that. Yeah, I'm yeah, to some, about it. yeah I, some. Not not too much on Instagram. Never, rarely on, on X. Um, but I got on Facebook before I had kids, so and I, my wife would put them on. But yeah, yeah I know now I feel like it only gets on there if it's like super cute. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know my kids got to just stay cute. I mean they're getting older, so it's it's a lot more work as as they're learning. Yeah. Yeah, my son's in like peak cuteness right now. Oh, it's stupid! And, uh, milk it's, it, milk just, it, run. It it only goes downhill. So. I was in the post office today, and this woman was like having a heart attack behind us over the color of my son's hair. She's like, <laughs> and I was like, thank you so much. <laughs> I worked really hard on this one. Yeah. I was he's like, do you have red hair? And I had a hat on. I was like, no, I don't. <laughs> it's a weird story. Neither does my I, wife. Who knows? I did. But then I, you know, flew a little too close to the sun and it all came out. <laughs> well, 
Well, we have to have you back soon. Uh, Ron Babcock, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Matty. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Matt Balaker podcast. To learn more, please check out mattbalaker.com and encourage your friends to like, subscribe, and share. Really appreciate it. Mm-hmm.